Hey folks, welcome back to fishing. I had someone uh, message me, wanting to know what the difference between a red ear sunfish and a bluegill is. Well, at a quick glance, not a lot, but when you look into it, there's a good bit difference. So let's get into it. I always want to start off with the records because a lot of people want to kind of know, you know, it's a very interesting topic. What's the biggest one of these, whatever that is, that I can catch? Well, the biggest one here in Mississippi was caught in Ripley, and um, it's 3.3 pounds. That's what the Mississippi State record right now is. And um, the United States record is um, 6 pounds and 3 ounces. And um, I think the overall length on that was 17 inches. Now, what does a shell cracker eat? Now, most commonly, they're going to eat snails. That's what they want to eat. Now, they'll eat other things like um, crawfish, smaller insects, um, insect larvae, leeches, minnows, um, any other smaller animal that lives in the water. Um, white grubs, yellow grubs, things like that. But that's, that's predominantly you're going to be your diet. If you're looking for red ear, and it's not spawning those are the things those are the lures the plastic lures that you're going to look for that's the colors you want a solid white either that or a not so much a chartreuse color but more of an actual real yellow yellow colored grub worm i've caught them on that i know i've caught them on chartreuse too but as i got older if i'm actually fishing for red ear i'm going to use a yellow grub lure something close to an inch or less long and now what i normally do is i'll buy the longer grubs and take and just break it in half and i'll take that and i'll, I'll jig fish with that and that way you get two lures for the price of one how do i identify a red ear sunfish or sun or shell cracker most commonly around here a lot of people call them shell crackers but um behind the gill plate where normally on a bluegill there's this bluish black dot on the backside of the gill plate on a bluegill, this has either a red little outline on the males or a orangish yellow color on the females. And um, one big distinct difference is the red ear have an actual, people call them another set of teeth. They're not actually teeth, but there's another set of plates in the backside of their throat that they use to crush the shells of the snails that they more commonly feed on. But um, an adult red ear sunfish is going to be about eight, nine inches long. And average, you know, a, an adult, you're looking at about maybe two pounds. That's the overall size that you're going to get on a, on, a, on a regular one. But they tend to congregate with bluegill and other panfish, but most commonly bluegill. And they have been known to actually spawn and breed with other bluegill and create hybrids. That's also pretty common. The bluegill are normally darker colors. I've seen purples, blues, you know, dark greens. Your red ear sunfish tend to be on the lighter side, you know, on the lighter greenish yellow colors, a, a higher color. And they do have the side striping colors like the bluegill it's just lighter shades now as far as where you're going to find your red ear sunfish at predominantly the same areas that you're going to find your bluegill around stumps around wooded structure around um lily pads algae covered area but they really they really like the aquatic vegetation because the snails that they feed on like the aquatic vegetation but you'll find these congregated in schools with brim in the same areas that brim are now red ear tend to want to go to deeper water they fish or they fish they hunt normally along the bottom they're surface feeders sometimes not as much as a bluegill you know how you hear a bluegill early in the morning smacking on the top of that water eating algae and stuff unless what they primarily want to feed on is getting slim the the red ear sunfish is, is going to feed along the bottom and they're feeding on completely different things than what the bluegill is so fish bouncing across the bottom that's what you really want to do 
a lot of times what you'll do is chunk your lure out with no split shot, no weight, just the hook and just, just the lure or the middle or whatever you're fishing with. I tend to fish with no weight at all because you're going to find your red ear in dead steel water. Most of them are in no current at all. They don't like being in current. That's not their primary location because you're not going to find the snails. You're not going to find the leeches. You're not going to find the small minnows in heavy current water or even really in, in a light current water. Those things tend to come kind of congregate towards dead water and that's where you're going to find your red ear sunfish at. Now what a lot of people don't know about the red ear sunfish is they are very important to the body of waters that they are in. They are what a lot of people call the parasite police. The snails that they feed on are necessary for the life cycle of quite a few different kind of parasites that live in fresh water. Um, before I get into this and, and, and mess it all up here, let's, let's take a minute and check this out from another YouTuber. There's a channel called SciShow. Check it out. Very interesting stuff. They can explain it way better than I can. Check this out. If your summer has ever included cooling off with a nice swim in a lake, you might be acquainted with something called swimmer's itch. These itchy red bumps appear on the exposed parts of your skin after you take a dip in a lake or pond, and they can last for a week or more. But swimmer's itch is more than just an annoying rash. It's actually caused by parasites that burrow into your skin and then die there. Yeah. Ew. The culprits are tiny worms called schistosomes. Each schistosome species specializes in a specific bird or mammal host. Some schistosome species target humans, causing a debilitating disease called schistosomiasis. But the ones that cause swimmers itch aren't after you. They're part of a different group of species whose hosts include ducks, geese, muskrats, and raccoons. That itchy rash is what happens when one of these schistosome larvae makes a mistake. Adult parasites live in their host's blood. And when they lay eggs, the host eventually poops them out. With a little luck, the eggs end up in water, where they hatch into larvae that swim around in search of the aquatic snails that they need to infect to complete the next stage of their life cycle. The baby schistosomes continue to multiply and develop inside the snail, and eventually the infected snail releases a second type of larva called cercarii into the water. This is where swimmer itch gets its technical name. Cercarial dermatitis. These little guys, each less than a millimeter long, head out to look for a member of their original host species to start the cycle all over again. But sometimes the cercarii mess up and burrow into a human swimmer's skin. It's a fatal mistake. They can't develop there, and so they die. And because dead baby parasites are definitely not something that's supposed to be in your body, they trigger an allergic reaction as they break down. That's what the itching and redness is from. Now, if you've ever went swimming in a shallow body of water and got what we call swimmer's itch, but it's red bumps all over you, now you know where it came from. That's actually dead parasites inside of your skin that your body has caused an allergic reaction to. So now you know. Also, there's a similar life cycle that follows the same thing, but instead of being inside of the waterfowl, it's in fish, but there are parasitic worms, there's grubs, there's a lot of different things that are all instrumental in the life cycle of the snail. So the red ear are extremely important to a body of water, it, it, a lot more than a lot of people even know. Now when to catch red ear sunfish or shell crackers, um, most of the people actually target red ear during the spawn which is during your early summer months, um, the last week of March, all the way up sometimes into August, and they'll spawn. But the thing is, unlike bluegill, bluegill can spawn as many as five times in one year. Um, your red ears only spawn once. That's it. And that's why if you've got a lot of people that are um, brim fishing in a general area and they're pulling those red ear out, they're coming out at normally a faster rate than what they could populate. And a lot of times if you've got stocked lakes, ponds, reservoirs where they're introducing fish into areas, they'll populate those areas back with red ear sunfish. Normally when people buy fish to stock into a pond, if you're buying bluegill, Honestly, about 25%, up to 25% of that load is going to be red ear just because of what they add to the water population. Now, they're brim, what everybody calls a brim. If you're out fishing and you're fishing for 
sunfish honestly i'd i'd keep the bluegill and i'd toss the red ear back just because the, the the benefits of what they are in a given body of water how to catch them extremely ultralight gear you don't need anything fancy you can catch them with a cane pole i use the little dock demon very light little rod but you just cast it out and you flick it just flick the tip and then reel a little bit flick the tip and reel a little bit and what you'll do is as that thing drifts down into the bottom of the water into the water column down to the bottom if they're up off the bottom which even though the males are down on the bottom taking care of the nest gardening nest and everything the females are still up feeding once they lay their eggs their job's done they literally make eggs deposit the eggs in the nest and they are done they walk away so they may be higher up in the water column than what the males are that are actually down there guarding the nest. So you want to bounce it about a foot up and just keep bouncing it. And during the spawn, they're either going to be hitting the bait because they're hungry or they're going to be hitting the bait because they don't want anything in the nest. One of the, one of the two, but that's going to be your two main ways to actually catch red ear sunfish. Now during the spawn, what the male does is he'll spend time and they'll make little nests about 12 to 14 inches in a circle. It looks like a bunch of circles along the bottom of the lake bed, but they'll make a bunch of little circles. Now they clean every rock, every pebble, everything they can. And basically what a lot of them try to do is get down to the sand. If there's a sandy bottom, that's what they're really looking for because I guess things move easier across the sand. They can guard it better. Not sure. Not a fish. Don't know. But... What they'll do is the male will come up to the female and click at them. And what they do is they take those plates in the back of their throat and pop them together and make a clicking sound. And basically, if 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 she's picking up what he's putting down, she'll come over there and she'll lay some eggs in his, in his nest. And what the male does, he'll guard that nest because as soon as she lays her eggs, she's out of there. She's on to either the next party or she's done spawning all together because a female red ear will actually lay eggs in multiple nests. Not unlike some women I know. Different subject. Anyway. But what they'll do is the males will guard those eggs for about 50 hours. After about 50 hours, those eggs hatch. And what you've got are tiny little fish. Now what the males do is they will guard those baby fish for about probably about three days and after about that third day hey they hungry they bored they got stuff they got to do man they out of here they on their own and the ones that don't get eat by birds and the ones that don't get eat by other larger fish well they live on the next year to to make some new red ears but one of the other in, interesting things is it has to do with the temperature of the water in itself in the area of the United States that it's in. And as you get further north, there's actually creel limits on red ear sunfish because of this. But in the warmer climate down south where we're at in Mississippi, Florida, Texas, you can have a spawn and the next year, those babies that were spawned, those fish are able to reproduce again that very next year. So whatever school of fish that you know was was hatched out that year the next year they're making more babies but up in the northern climates because red ear because of their benefits of decreasing the parasites in the water they've been introduced all over the united states now they're native to the southeast united states predominantly found in texas in the colder climates it takes two years that next season those fish that were hatched out are not ready to spawn again. So what there is, there, there's like a one year layover from, you know, cycles and it's a little slower. And I, what I think, what I think's happening is in those colder climates, those male fish, well, they still young and, and y'all know what cold water does to a man. And I, I think it's affecting the fish population. Now, as far as tackle on what to use to catch a red ear sunfish, I wouldn't go any heavier than a 10 pound line, probably about six, to be honest. I, you know, I think that's what's on my little dock demon reel is um, six pound test line. And you want to go with either a number six or a number eight hook. 
and sometimes you can use the, the, the tiniest little split shot. I think it's a 132nd ounce split shot, but like I said, when I'm brim fishing, I don't use split shot at all. I just let the water carry it. That way it, it, it falls slower and it's in front of the fish longer if they're not on the bottom feeding. But simple, easy, light tackle. But the red ears do tend to grow a little bit bigger than your bluegill now. So they put on a fight. That's actually a very aggressive fish during spawn, especially because they're really just kind of in guard. They're in bulldog mode. They're guarding the nest, guarding the eggs, guarding the babies. So anything that gets near them, they're just hitting it. You know, they're basically trying to kill it or move it out of the way just so there's no danger to the new fish coming into the hatchery. So. But at the end of the day, it's um, it's probably one of the easiest sports to get into. Hey, the sport of fishing, like Richard Jean said, it, it is unlike any other. It, it's, it's a lot of fun. You can do it at your wheel, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Hey, you can always go get your hook wet somewhere. So it's something that you can do as a hobby or actually a sport fish you can get into. Hey, there's people that make a lot of money fishing on the weekends. And you can turn it into a full-time job. It is what it is. It's, it's a lot to it. It's a lot of interest in it. And it's always beneficial to get younger kids involved in fishing because you never know where where the next the next famous you know fishing youtubers coming from you just never know at your next environmentalist you know the folks that actually take care of the the, the world we live in start by appreciating nature and and the world we live in and all that comes from being out in it um you can't appreciate nature from just staring at a tv screen or a cell phone or you know your laptop you got to get out in it man so whatever you do hey oh to answer your question yeah the email i hope that i hope that was enough information it's probably more than what you wanted but there it is that's everything i got for you on a red ear sunfish or a shell cracker call it what you want but um whatever you do hey go fishing